This is Q on CBC Radio 1 across Canada, Sirius Satellite and PRI in the United States. Take a listen to this. Do you know how many Oscars I've won? Do you know how many Golden Globes I've won? And I'd be like, gee, Harvey, do you know how many Boy Scout merit badges I have and an Emmy? Harvey is, he's a tough, tough guy with incredible taste. He's a maverick. He is absolutely 100% in that big Hollywood mogul tradition. A modern uh, showmanship in a way, almost a little touch of uh, the sensationalism of a DeMille. I'd say 50% genius, 50% asshole. I would think that the, the movie making world would be a less interesting place if, if, if he's not a, uh, a player uh, in it. There you go. Well, the Harvey in question is American film producer Harvey Weinstein, a former New Yorker turned Buffalo concert promoter. He's best known for co-founding Miramax Films in 1979 with his brother Bob. And with unexpected hits like Sex, Lies, and Videotape, Pulp Fiction, Sling Blade, Harvey Weinstein's movies have reshaped the American film lands- landscape and scored 292 Oscar nominations and 67 awards in the process. And as depicted in the new documentary film Unauthorized, The Harvey Weinstein Project, he is also a polarizing figure, fearless about butting heads with staff, filmmakers, and the Hollywood studios. Well, in keeping with his reputation, if Harvey Weinstein had his way, the film Unauthorized, The Harvey Weinstein Project, would not exist. But that didn't discourage my next guest from making it. Barry Averich is a Canadian filmmaker, producer, and marketing executive. And he is the director of Unauthorized, the Harvey Weinstein Project. And right now, Barry Averich joins me in Studio Q. Hello, sir. How are you? Nice to see you again. Good to see you. You always come in with your compelling films. Look at you. I, I, I want to get into Harry, uh, Harry Harvey Weinstein's reservations about your film, because uh, there must be an interesting story behind that. But first, a little context. The American film industry has had no shortage of controversial larger-than-life figures. Where does Weinstein fit in? First of all, I don't like to talk about my work. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It, it, you know, of course, Billy Bob Thornton, yes. uh, uh, you know, uh, Harvey paid the most money ever for an independent film. He picked up Sling Blade, $10 million, and I thought I'd six degrees it back to that for you. That Thank wonderful you. Day Thank you, you, Barry. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, Har- Harvey Weinstein, you know, is, is a, an extraordinary figure because when you go back to the moguls of the day, Jack Warner, Harry Cohn, uh, um, you know, all Daryl Zanuck, these guys were huge moguls, but they weren't brands. Harvey Weinstein was really the first consumer brand. What does that mean? Well, people, people would open up the newspaper and say, I want to see a Miramax film hmm. because it meant generally good, art, indie. Nobody picks up a newspaper and says, I want to see a Paramount film this weekend. And by the way, before we get into uh, the darker side or the difficulties of, of Harvey Weinstein, he is responsible for some of the most incredible films, some of my favorite films, first first of all, starting with foreign films like Cinema Paradiso uh, and, and, and Pelle the Conqueror, and then into the kind of stuff like Pulp Fiction and so many of the indie greats that, that we love, right? Well, that's the great dichotomy and you know, in, in Harvey Weinstein. He has this 300-pound you know, a freight train of a man that comes through a meeting tearing phones out of walls and throwing computers at your head and then has this magnificent taste to make sure films like My Left Foot and The English Patient happen. It it is quite extraordinary. When did you decide and why that you wanted to actually make a film about him? I made a film in 05 called The Last Mogul about Lou Wasserman. And when I interviewed people and I said, was Lou Wasserman, who of course ran Universal Studios for six decades in this, you know, major power. Uh, And I'd say to people, do you really think that Lou Wasserman is the last mogul? And some would definitively say, yes, he's the last mogul. And others would say, well, there's Harvey Weinstein. (laughs) And so I parked that for a bit and I I contacted Harvey and said, you know, I want to make this film about you. You're the, you know, the the follow-up to Lou Wasserman. And his response was, that's a great idea and I'll let you know when I'm ready. You're the guy. (laughs) <laughs> he still isn't ready, but you've made the film. That's right. <laughs> Weinstein was a, a hugely successful concert promoter yes. before starting Miramax Films. Miramax, by the way, is named after his parents, right? Miriam and Max. That's correct. Uh, he starts uh, Miramax in 79 with his brother. He seemed to take those skills from being a concert promoter for, forward. Much of Miramax's early success wasn't so much based on releasing great films, but rather on how they released them. What was it that worked for Weinstein in that regard? Well, again, going back to the concert days, he completely understood that you had to fill every seat. And he took that uh, tactic and that strategy to the film business. And then it was really all about marketing. I mean, specifically, you know, let's look at the crying game. 
This was a film that did not do well in England. Crazy story. And, and he came up with this brilliant idea. This is pre-internet, pre-blogging, pre-tweeting to say, don't give away the shocking twist in the film. Keep it quiet. Don't give it away. And the media and the public went along with it, which was unbelievable. So you went to see The Crying Game to see what it was. It wasn't a particularly enthralling, fast-paced film, but it was all about the marketing. Same thing with Sex, Lies, and Videotape. First film, first indie film that, that a, a company bought millions of dollars in television advertising for. Nobody did that. You ran a small little ad in the newspaper, and you hoped that word of mouth would pick it up. There's two Weinsteins. There's Harvey and Bob. They yes. work together. We know Harvey. We don't really know Bob as much. Harvey's the public figure. How does their partnership work? Well, I think it's brilliant. I think, I think you know, somewhere along the way, Bob decided to be the, the, the man in the shadows who, who's sort of the business head. Somebody in the film says, you know, Harvey's greed and, and Bob is business. Bob la- launched the Dimension label, films like Scary Movie and Scream and The Crow, films that made money. And often it was Dimension, Bob's label, that kept the business alive while Harvey was uh, sometimes making films that were just major disasters. And as Miramax slowly but steadily begins its rise uh, into the 90s and then even into this decade, Weinstein was, Harvey, was gaining a reputation for being something of a bully and and an intimidator. I mean, you really make the point through the people you interview um, yeah. who had all kinds of proximity to him I mean assistants who were reduced to tears film producers actors uh, this was a really difficult guy to work with why do people keep working with him well it's funny it, it's amazing you go back often you go back to a man that has the largest check you go back to a man that believes in art which he does I mean Jay, I have to tell this very very fast story but you know James Ivory the great director from Merchant Ivory Room with a View Howard's End some of the greatest films made this film Mr. and Mrs. Bridge uh, um, with Harvey Weinstein and Harvey insisted on cutting the film or attempting to try and cut the film he bullied these boys around like crazy and and James Ivory said I will never work with him again and then out comes uh, um, uh, Shakespeare in Love and James Ivory's you know walking around town trying to get uh, a film made without any luck and he takes a subway down to Tribeca walks into Harvey's office and shows him the script and says alright I'm back and he goes back and I said that to James Ivory why did you go back if he was such a horrible man he goes I don't know I don't know and you know and then he had a you know the film was the golden bull and they had a, a horrendous time on that again they ended up buying the film back they had a lot of money then but when Harvey Weinstein's getting involved in recutting films ordering nine minutes out of this or uh, let's do you know, edit this somehow is that business for him or does he consider himself an artist well Harvey Scissorhands I mean that's the great debate when you buy a film and you own it should you have the right to alter it if you buy a painting by you know Picasso or whoever, should you have a right, you know, to to, to paint over it and to and to alter the film? Uh, and, and yet, and one of the journalists in your film says, you know, when I file a story or an editorial, my my the editors of my paper still have the right to to affect the copy, right? Well, you know, Harvey has an instinct in terms of marketing a film, and he's about to do the same with the King's Speech. There's a lot of controversy that he wants to cut. The King's Speech down another 12 minutes to make it more palatable for a North American audience, which is, I think, quite amazing as I, I, the film worked for me. But he's done this with Cinema Paradiso. He's done this with, with uh, Sling Blade. Uh, and he does it generally uh, quite well. He understands an instinct. Well, there, there's filmmakers who testify that the cuts he demanded, which they originally argued against, actually improved their films, right? Sling Blade's one of them. Yeah. So he has the instincts. He does have an instinct in terms of audience attention span and where a, where a film drags. I mean, I, I, I remember sitting in a, uh, a focus group with him, a, a research uh, study on one of the films, and, and he would literally snap his fingers at moments where there should be cuts or where the audience was fidgeting. You know, he knows film. Miramax is credited with spurring on the indie film renaissance in the late 80s and early 90s with movies like the ones we've been talking about, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, The Crying Game, most famously Pulp Fiction. You argue in your doc that the success of these movies forever changed independent film. How so? Well, you know, it it became the story again. You know, this was an era of the blockbuster that Harvey came in at that time. Jaws and, you know, Star Wars. And and I think what he ended up doing was making films accessible. You you, you weren't, the general public wasn't necessarily going to run to see a subtitled film or obscure stories. Making art films or making, indie films. Making arts and indie films and getting people in there, bringing the audience into the theater to see them. And that, and that suddenly, 
you know, uh, created this massive audience for foreign film, indie film. Some argue that he raised the stakes too high, though, for independent films. Suddenly, indie films become films that are bankrolled by $100 million. Was, was what he has done good for independent film? Well, I think so. I mean, at the end of the day, the argument is, did he end up paying too much for indie film, $10 million for Sling Blade, $10 million for the film Happy Texas that didn't end up working. He, he raised the costs to market and to, and to uh, ultimately acquire these films, which I think hurt indie cinema and, and spawning, uh, ended up spawning a million indie companies like Miramax. Most of them haven't worked. Let's get to your uh, cojones uh, for for deciding to uh, forge ahead with this film because you you make no shortage of uh, um, give us no shortage of evidence in the film that this is a powerful guy who can make and break people uh, uh, in in the business. But you decide to go ahead with this film even though um, this is an unauthorized documentary. Harvey Weinstein personally advised you not to make this film. What were his concerns? Well, you know, I, I think. I'll t- You have to understand something. My background is marketing. I've marketed thousands of films. I worked on marketing Miramax's films in Canada for 15 years. So I've seen him. I know him. He doesn't quite know what to make of me in terms of the fact that I was going to go ahead with this. I think ultimately his concerns were, like anybody else, is that he does not have final cut. You know, how was I going to perceive him? You know, when we met the night before the Oscars last year, and he said, what are you going to say? I'm 50% asshole, 50% genius, you know, as you heard in the film. So what? And I said, well, it's an incredible story. And he would come up with tens and dozens of other people that I should make films about, but he didn't want me to go ahead, but ultimately because he wouldn't have Final Cut. Well, you end up getting a lot of big names in this film, including uh, Scorsese, Marty Scorsese, uh, George Hickenlooper, the filmmaker who's very open about his uh, issues with <laughs> with uh, Harvey Weinstein, uh, writer John Irving. To your knowledge, did Harvey Weinstein discourage people from cooperating in your film? To my knowledge, I, I you know I, I can bring in a telephone book of names of, of people that you know he he would call and say, "Don't get involved." People that would call him and say, "Listen, I'm thinking of doing Barry's film," and he'd give them. You know, it was never forceful would be, well, my friends aren't participating, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, and, and, and the last conversation that we had, I mean, we continue this bizarre email relationship. The last conversation I had was he said, well, all right, you fine, you go ahead with this, but on Monday morning, I'm showing up at your door with a film crew and making a film about you. I said, great. But so why, why would people like uh, Scorsese ba- do it? Why, why, why did they tell you that they w- would agree to do your film? I think we live, you know, Hollywood's a world where, you know, you never know. And I think there's been so much difficulties in Scorsese and and Harvey's relationship, specifically on the film The Gangs of New York, where they fought and then again went back, uh, Marty went back and did The Aviator. I think Harvey, I think uh, Marty wanted to set the record straight and say nice things about him, although you can see in the interview, (laughs) he's very, very restrained. He's a powerful and influential figure, Harvey Weinstein. Are Are you... Do you have concerns? This is career suicide for you to make this documentary? No worries. No, I, I'm just kidding. Um, um, no, I mean, you know, the one, one newspaper out of Australia had a headline that this must be career suicide in making this film. I heard the same thing with The Last Mogul. Uh, I don't think an American could have made the film. Uh, I think people would have been too nervous to take him on. Uh, it makes a difference that you're Canadian. A hundred percent. I mean, a hundred percent. And you know, you're still operating in the same entertainment business, aren't you? I am, but you know, I've I've got my sort of you know rep for making these films about Hollywood figures. They're very, very fair. They're even-handed. They're not a true Hollywood story. Hatchet jobs. I'm not talking about you know Harvey's family or his wives or anything. And so they're balanced films. I you know I I, I as I said to Harvey as we sat there last year, I said you know if you have any concerns once this film comes out, I, I'll be completely shocked. The Weinstein brothers are no longer with Miramax. Uh, they started a new company simply called the Weinstein Company. It hasn't been as successful as Miramax was in its in its heyday. Do you think if his career was at a more upbeat point right now, he would be more welcoming uh, to a documentary being made about, about him? Well, he did say to me, you know, wait, you know, there's another act here. And I mean, and with Harvey, as you chase the story and you keep, you know, I keep editing and changing things, it, it does completely evolve on a daily basis. I, I think, John, the point is that, you know, he starts the Weinstein Company, has a couple of, a lot of films that don't do well, and then surprises everybody roaring back with Inglorious Bastards. And here he is dominating the story again with the King's Speech versus 
social network. He'll probably be on stage again, right, at the Oscars? If the Kings... <laughs> he oh, likes to go on stage when they, his films oh, win? A- absolutely. I mean, if the fighter one would be a different story because, you know, it, it isn't his film. He picked it up. The King's Speech, I think he will definitely be on that stage. And it's going to be fascinating to watch because it takes you back to the big battle between Shakespeare and love and saving Private Ryan, yeah. where no one expected Shakespeare and love to work. And that's at that point where Harvey redefined the Oscar rules. Throughout the film, he's characterized as both a monster and a genius. Ultimately, how, how do you see him? As a monster and a genius. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know he, he's... Listen, you know, you grow up working for moguls, and I've worked with all the Canadian ones, and, you know, you understand that the screaming and the yelling is performance. Uh, it isn't personal. And, you know, and Harvey is, you know, over the top, old mogul tradition of, of screaming and yelling and demanding perfection and being difficult. Uh, and that's part of the, you know, the art and the, and the madness of Harvey Weinstein. Uh, I've said it, uh, I said it earlier, it, it is a compelling documentary. Thank you. C- congrats to you. And thanks. Uh, thanks very much for taking the time to come in here and, and having the, uh, the fortitude to forge ahead with this doc. My pleasure. That's filmmaker Barry Averich. His new film is called Unauthorized, The Harvey Weinstein Project. And Barry Averich has been with me here in Studio Q.